I'll be doing most of my demoing today in Epicor Inc, where the dollar is the base currency. But I've got other companies in here. I've got Epicor Europe running in the Euro. I've got Epicor Mexico running in the Mexican peso. So it may not be relevant at the moment, but if you do acquire new companies or new separate financial identification numbers, what you'll be able to do is actually have those companies all in the same database or separate databases, depending on how you want it. And they will all talk to one another. We can do intercompany purchase orders between uh, these companies and therefore all of the eliminations are done. So any debt passing between companies is taken care of. And in fact, everything here for me consolidates up to Epicor Corporation. All that's in there is really a general ledger at that point to do the consolidation. So you've got capabilities to do full multi-company cash flow, uh, consolidated profit and loss or income statement and so on. Then within a company, you can have multiple sites or you may call it a plant or a facility. So, you know, you can then start to divisionalize all of your manufacturing resources. You can divisionalize your inventory across these particular sites. And therefore, even sales, discounts, cost of goods sold is all automatically divisionalized for you. So you can really get down to an income statement or a profit center at the site level within a company. And then multi-language, we've got around about 48 languages we support now based on our coverage around the world. And Epicor typically like to do business where you do business. In some countries, we do offer partner support, which everyone is one of those up in Canada. I'm actually based out of Montreal myself, but I'm a direct Epicor employee. And Brendan, who's joining us today, is also out of Toronto. He's a direct employee. But we are multi-language. And then if I just pop down into the menu here in the financial suite, you'll also see a currency management module for multi-currency capabilities as well. Those currencies have got their own realized and unrealized gain and loss account behind them for the income statement and the balance sheet. So really just touching on the fact that we want to make sure we protect your investments. Some of it may not be relevant at the moment, but those multi capabilities for multi-company, multi-site, multi-language and multi-currency give you a lot of flexibility in the future. Any questions so far? The product itself can be deployed in a number of options. The most common now going forward is really SaaS, you know, software as a service where we would have a multi-tenant environment where you just access the software out of that environment. You can have multiple databases running in there because as you implement, you'd want a pilot environment to do all your testing, to make sure you're designing your processes and the as is has been mapped over to the 2B. And then you could have a production environment within your, your cloud as well. So it's even though you're up in the cloud, you can still have multiple environments to do testing and going forward and implementing as well. We offer a hybrid where you could also get your own software hosted. And then we do do on-premise. Uh, we do have some customers that I would cloud as cloud never. Um, they make, you know, very expensive equipment for the government, for defense, for example, and they will never be able to go in the cloud. But the deployment choice is absolutely yours, depending on going forward. But as I said, nowadays, most, most customers want to be cloud-based in a multi-tenant environment. Now, the system itself, if I just look at the length and breadth of Epicor, remember I'm all powerful, so I can see the whole menu in here. Um, once you actually put securities on the system, first of all, you need to log into Epicor so we can actually synchronize your user login with your Active Directory. So that's one less password to remember. And then once you're in, you'll get menu security capabilities. So some people might just see that production management suite and the sub menus or one or two of the sub menus within it. Then we can actually go down to process security where once you're in a menu, for example, in accounts payable, if I was doing the payment entry within here, and I can actually search the menu as well if I want to just search for anything in here. If I was doing payment entry in accounts payable, I might be allowed to go in there and get the payments teed up, but I may not be allowed to post them. So we can fine tune those securities. And also within Epicor, we do go down to the field level and security. So if you're receiving in material, and you don't want people to see the unit cost of what they're receiving in, you can hide that field. And what that means is whether I'm in a browser or client or on an iPad or a tablet running Epicor, I will never see that field. So it's possible to get full segregation of duties 
we typically know what kind of roles or security roles are needed to run the system out of the box, but securities are, are a very important part of the whole procedure. Now, in terms of navigating my way around, I've got a homepage layout that's set up for me as a demo person to be able to demo everything from sales right through to finance just on this homepage for the common things I'm in. But a bit like your cell phone, I'll just switch over to Brian Howard. If I picked up two people's cell phones, though I can't do that anymore with COVID, we'd probably see that no two cell phones look alike. We all like our home our home screens to be set up slightly differently, even if you had the exact same model of iPhone or Samsung, everyone's menu is going to be slightly different. So therefore our home pages are the same. Now we do offer home page personas out of the box for executives, finance, production, materials, and sales, but then you can tailor this home page layout to suit. Now my home page layout, I've got very shortcuts on the home page here. I've got a live tile that gives me my sales order open uh, value plus the count of open orders by customer at the moment. That's what we call data discovery tiles. But if I'm a finance person, I might be wanting to run an aging dashboard here um, where I can look at my AR amount, my accounts payable aging amount as well down below in a dashboard view like this. Again, those are live EDD Epicor data discovery tiles. I might want to look at my production floor where these nodes on the shop floor are actually telling me my overall equipment efficiency of some of the key work centers or what we term a resource in Epicor. Shop loading, I might want to just cycle through an animated view of shop loading here, where I can look at various loads for employees or machinery that's out in the shop floor. I've got loading here for some of these CNC machines. And again, I can see for the next 10 days, the estimated production hours loaded onto that machine. You'll see to, throughout the demo today, anywhere we've got a grid in Epicor, you can instantly just export that grid out to Excel. And that just happened to open up here on my second screen down below. So I'll just drag that back up. So all of these grids can be ported out to Excel. And you'll see later on that I can actually bring data back from Excel as well into the system to do updates and inserts on the grids, which is very useful. Then I've got a sales home layout here where I'm looking at my totals by state um, for sales. And I can see over here, I can actually see what the actuals are versus the goals for each state. And again, I've got total charges so far by customer or by state on a monthly basis. So the, the message here is this homepage really is very tailorable in the way you want to set it up. If I wanted to create perhaps a new shortcut in here, what I can do is I can actually just go in and edit my homepage and I've got various different tiles I can add. We've got the data discovery views that you've been seeing here, or I may just want an app link and based on my securities, what I can see if I start looking for something to do with engineering in here, what I can do is I can actually take that engineering tile and then just add a new shortcut. I could resize that shortcut if I wanted to, and then I might want to come over here and just say, I'm going to place that shortcut um, right onto my homepage. So very easy to manipulate the layout of the home page. That's one way of getting into something. Other ways are again by searching the menu. If I wanted to go into job entry, for example, to start looking at jobs, I've got all of the access to the various menus where I've got that job entry. And that would then take me into a list of my jobs that I can configure so as I can immediately drill down into those jobs or what you might call a, a work order in today's world. So just ease of use is there depending upon how you want to navigate your way around the system. We also can set up favorites in the favorites bar. So as you navigate your way around the menu, I've got some finance favorites in here. Um, I might want to go into the menu again and search within here and say, I want to look for a cash flow shortcut in here. And once I've got the cash flow, I might then want to add that into my favorites bar. I can select the folder or add a new folder in here and I'll put that in my finance folder, for example. And now that will be in my favorites. And it's important that we do this because a lot of our customers come from this menu, legacy customers, where we always had that favorites bar. And when we went to this new active homepage layout, we wanted to keep something that was similar. So we always do think about our legacy customers going forward, even as the technology changes. Now these data discovery views, um, what we do offer is we offer a whole plethora of data discovery views out of the box, whether you're looking at age payables, age receivables, 
You might be looking at a cost of goods sold analysis, obsolete stock, uh, slow moving stock. Um, these are all out of the box tiles that you can actually pop right onto your homepage. So as you take your first sip of coffee or tea in the morning, you've got tactical data right in front of you on the homepage. Now you can create your own, and I really do mean you because everyone in Epicor will teach you how to update or create your own data discovery views in here. But I can actually drill into that view right in my homepage. And I'm looking at by open value and open count by customer. I might think that's a little bit too granular uh, for me to do that. So what I might want to do is I'll say, well, let's look at it by more customer group instead. Or I might want to look at it by product line, which we call a product group inside of Epicor. So once I've added those new columns in there, I've got the ability to actually now look at it by customer group as opposed to looking at it by customer, or I could be looking at it by product line as well. And then you've got filters which you can add. And um, you know, I might just want to look at fabricated products versus my printed circuit boards, my machine building parts. So I've got the ability to filter down into that data, or I can just clear those filters and go back to the way I wanted it uh, within there. Pie chart, line charts, however you want to do this. I've got a cumulative percentage. I'm not a big fan of that. I'd rather just see an average percentage on there. So I'm manipulating the views. I can manipulate the colors as well. And once I'm happy with that, I would just save my changes to that data discovery view. And when I come back to my home page and refresh that data, you'll see it's now by customer group. So these views are very tailorable. And it will also always let you get back down into the underlying data as well. So if you had your top 10 late purchase orders, for example, it would be listing them down below. And from here, what that means I can do is I can go straight to the customer record. I'm looking at the customer, they're in focus. Do I want to do a return material authorization? Anything that you're looking at in the data that's supplying this information up above, I could be looking at part numbers or the sales order number, for example. I'll be able to drill the sales order entry. So not only are you looking at nice graphs and measures, you've got that underlying data to immediately take you into the transactions as well, depending where you want to go. Now, some other navigation. Typically, in most systems in the past, you probably had to be an order entry. If you wanted to look at a customer or in purchase order entry or supplier, if you're looking at suppliers, but all of that goes away. I can actually use enterprise search in Epicor. And what that allows me to do is if I'm talking to a customer, and let's say I'm talking to Addison, I can immediately do a search throughout the entire database for everything that's going on with Addison. So if I look at all results, I've got cases in CRM, help desk cases, or I've got order lines, part transactions, I've got a couple of projects running for Addison. I can see all of that data right in there. But like a true search engine, the more information I type in here, if they now give me a purchase order number, I can slim and refine that data down. I've got an invoice that they're looking for. I'll now immediately open up the invoice tracker screen in here. And once I'm in the invoice, what I want to be able to do is further lean out your day-to-day -day processes and make those transactions easy by actually sending that invoice immediately out of the system. So the invoice has come into focus. What I'll do now is I'll actually send a copy of that invoice out to either one recipient or multiple recipients. So all of the email routing is actually built right into Epicor. So if I go ahead and generate that, it's going to tell me that if I wanted to, the routed SSRS view is on. So let's just generate that again. I'll enable the routing this time. And it's now sent that invoice out to either the customer if that customer was factoring the receivables, it might send it out to the person that's also factoring the receivables as well. So we'll automatically email and route any document out of the system. Now we're going to be looking at documents closer because you'll be attaching documents to quotes. You might be attaching documents to the order, the order lines. You might have documents attached out into jobs in the floor for work instructions. And there is that particular email that just got sent out. Dear Andrew, Here's your invoice, and let me just preview that, and you'll actually see there is the invoice that went out. Now, that's just our boilerplate SQL report builder format for the invoice. I popped your company logo on there, and part of the training, too, is we'll teach you how to tailor these particular documents 
And the way that works is Evron and Epicor would sit down with you, maybe do your invoice, put your company logo on there, change the fonts, get rid of that grayscale background and make it look like a corporate document that belongs to you. And then you're able to change any document in Epicor, even an H receivables report, purchase order form, they're all in this particular format. Anybody got any questions about that automated email that went out of the system? All good so far? So that's just some email routing that's built right into Epicor. There's some other tools in, that are in here. It's all very well having functionality and technology at your fingertips, but I do want to talk about our help and support center. This is a phenomenal resource. and um, We've got Epicor Embedded Education in here. And that embedded education is actually the same education and courses that we certify Evron consultants, our consultants, and any partner for that matter, it's available to you. So everything from doing an accounts payable course to learning how to create a dashboard using our dashboard reporting tool, which incidentally is just very like Excel built right into the product, you can run those education courses. Um, we also have an Epicare website you'll be able to log into if you want to check knowledge bases or just look for other information on the product. But we all have different ways of learning. And one of those might just be a video, for example. So, you know, I changed the tail light on my car the other day and my son Roddy said, Dad, how did you manage to do that? And I said, well, I actually just went and watched the, a YouTube video. So it's the way people tend to learn now. So we've got volumes of videos where I might want to learn how to process an inspection inside of Epicor. I'll actually be able to play that back and go through that whole inspection process. And then it will take me right into non-conformance as an Epicor and right through that video. So there are great learning resources available, white papers, articles throughout that entire learning center that's inside of Epicor. The education team works with the development team. Very important consideration because as we release new functionality every six months or so, as we do Scrum and Agile development, uh, that's a high quality release. We're also releasing all of that education material as well at the same time. Any questions? So typically any shortcuts you have on the homepage, I might be doing purchase order entry daily. I'm gonna have a shortcut to go into the purchase order entry screen. I've got access then to these purchase orders. You'll see as you go into various forms in Epicor, this is a closed PO. There's always options in here to actually copy transactions. So once you use enterprise search to go and find an existing um, particular PO or particular sales order, you'll be able to duplicate that or copy that purchase order if you wanted to. So very quickly, transactions can be copied. Um, do I want to get the latest part revision information? Do I want to get the latest supplier price? Yes, I'll go ahead and do that. And then it will actually just go ahead and create that purchase order for me. All of these forms um, have got hotkeys available in them where what you'll actually be able to do is you'll be actually able to access the hotkeys. So you can do everything instead of using click and drag or the mouse to do it, you can actually use the keyboard shortcuts. Everything is on a slide out panel. So we've got one page to look at all the transaction. I'm looking at the order header details for a purchase order right now. Now I can see all of the lines in there. If I wanted to look at comments on that PO at the header, I'd be able to see them as well. But you can always drill down into the line detail if you need a little bit more information. I've got all of that line detail. And typically Epicor is all about one place to do everything, best practice, whether I'm buying an inventory part, whether I'm buying an expense or MRO item, it's another line. I could buy direct to a job. I could be buying an outside contracting service for, um, could be consulting, it could be some sort of outside subcontract for plating or heat treatment. It can all be done in that same purchase order within a different line type within the PO as well. And then all of the activities in here as well. If I want to look at a PO that's perhaps already been received, I'd see the receipt and the invoice activity in there as well. So it makes navigation and access to information in these forms very easy as you navigate your way around a particular form. And because you're in a web browser as well, if you do want to resize these things, you can zoom in and zoom out of particular forms. Or if I wanted to, what I could be doing is I could actually be running this whole system on an iPad right now. 
So I've got my purchase order entry in there. And then if I just go back to the home page, everything will automatically resize and adjust for me back on that particular home page. So it's browser based, browser agnostic. For those of you that are using a MacBook, you'll actually be able to use the EpiCore system on that MacBook because we are browser based. Just some other screens in here that I want to talk about. There is a browser based shop floor screen. So if I go to employee 100, I would log in. I'd be into a shop floor manufacturing execution system. We're just actually good in the process of renaming this just back to data collection. There's sometimes too many acronyms in our software. So I might want to go into an electronic work queue where I can see all of the jobs that are currently lined up for me, uh, available as a job that's one operation away, expected as more than one operation away in here. So that's real time paperless production. You may just want to go in and start an activity where you're going to immediately go into production, rework or indirect. And you'll see later on a barcoded job traveler where I can just have people scan right onto those particular jobs. So the shop floor interface, again, it could be running on a tablet. It could be running on a computer out in the shop floor. It's all based for button navigation and ease of use within there. We'll also be touching today here and there on our applications as well. So for those of you that have got an iPhone or an iOS device, as I think it's called, I'm an Android user, you'll be able to download apps and Android users as well as you're about to see. So we've got customer relationship management applications. I can take and generate new leads in here, convert those over into opportunities, and then hopefully they'll eventually become a customer. So we can actually take orders and create quotes on this particular app. We were talking to Addison earlier. I can call them from the app. There's a map navigation built into the CRM app. In fact, if you're in a certain geographical area, you can use this to optimize a route if you're going to do customer visits using our CRM app within here. Um, but I could be visiting that customer and say, well, just before I walk in the door, what's happening with the financials? Oh, they've got an overdue amount there of about $83,000. I probably now want to go to the CRM log just to see what's happening and why they've got that amount outstanding on that particular customer account. But it's a very well-rounded app, um, nice interface, uh, just to be able to start generating leads and such like in here, um, all done via that CRM application. Our wireless warehouse app can also be used for production as well. I'm out in the shop floor. Uh, I might want to track a part number to see where it is. I could scan that in if I walked up to the area in the warehouse where that is. If it's barcoded, I can see all of the locations, 11 boxes, four cases, six dozen, 200 of each. So you'll see in our uh, unit of measure capabilities, we can do multiple UOMs at the same part level if I wanted to. If I'm a material handler, I'd have a material queue, so I might be doing put away of purchases I've received in the warehouse that then need to get put away in stock. I might be doing something where I'm taking parts to inspection, or it could just be picking an order where I've got to take an order out to the shipping dock or something. So there's a complete material queue in there as well. Purchase order receipts, ease of use is there to receive POs, create shipments, even proof of delivery. So we've got this app where we can actually know take a picture of what we've delivered, take a signature electronically, and those documents will now be uploaded and attached in the ERP system. So there's a plethora of apps available. Some of them you can actually download and run in demo mode. Time entry, if it's applicable, if you've got people putting time into the system that aren't necessarily shop floor users. Expense entry, if you did want to use Epicor to put in miscellaneous expenses or expenses against the project, you can take a picture of a receipt and actually attach it to the expenses you're putting it in and so on. So there are lots of different applications in here. We also want to become your technology partner where I can go in here and I could say, you know, show me a product uh, 1223, for example. And this is e Eva, Epicor Virtual Agent. And Epicor Virtual Agent is really a tool where it will take away the mundane tasks that you do day to day and it will actually start to allow you to actually ask the system questions. So it's saying, I found an item 1223, not a product 1223. I'm used to jumping between different databases where we call this different things. And now what Eva will do is she'll actually answer me back and give me information on that particular item. 
So I'm going to get pricing on that particular item. I'll say, OK, this is for Addison. Now, it's actually got language recognition as well. But because of my uh, slightly Scottish accent, I always have a hard time picking it up off my desk. And sometimes she has a hard time understanding me. But the language recognition is pretty powerful in here. So that will calculate pricing now for Addison for a certain quantity that I put in. The pricing in Epicor can be at a, a group level. It can go right down to a customer or a ship to level in here. So now it's brought the pricing back. And I'll just go ahead and say I want to now enter a quote for that for Addison. They actually want a quantity of 10, not 5. And then what I'll do is I'll now just go ahead and create the quote. Now, what this is doing is if you think about the tasks of doing a day-to-day -day quote inside of a system, it's already now created quote 1186. I could now mark that as quoted. That approval could be routed through to Mary. It could be routed through to Dan. It doesn't need to be on my feed. And now, yes, that will be approved. So it's a really nice way of being able to do those day-to-day -day tasks using the Microsoft Azure AI that you just saw there, artificial intelligence, and actually speed the, the ability to do all of those tasks up. So if I now actually go into opportunity quote entry, and I go and look at that quote that I just created, which was quote 1186, it should be sitting in the system, and there it is. So that's Epicor Virtual Agent. There's various skills that she has from creating quotes, price lookups, orders, that type of thing. It's a really nice way of changing the way you do things day to day. Now I want to talk about dashboard reporting and the ability to not just look at data, but update data in dashboards as well. So I could start by looking at supplier relationship management dashboard. My user, and Epicor is connected to a, a buyer called Howard Lowe. And what you'll see in this particular supplier relationship management dashboard is all of the suppliers that Howard is connected to. As I look at each supplier, I can see their delivery below, their on-time delivery. If anything's late, it shows up as an exception. It's bright red in there, just like Excel, where you can do conditional formatting. But different here is if I wanted to look at that packing slip, providing I've got the security rights to do so, I can right click and then drill down into that receipt and track it read only or receipt entry gives me access to the receipt if I was allowed to. Now I'm looking at data in here. I'm looking at quality performance for all of these suppliers where I can see I actually had a failure for ABC Metals. Um, I'm looking at their purchase orders. I can drill down into those purchase orders if I want to update them and so on. But you'll notice in the top grid here, what we've also got is we've got some columns are grayed out, some will be opened up. So for Howard Lowe as a user, I'm allowing him to make updates in some of these columns. So for example, if the address was incorrect for Acme and he wanted to update that, I don't want him necessarily accessing supplier entry. So I can choose for certain users to let them update certain columns on that grid. And you'll see that will actually update a change log, letting me know the date, the time, the user, what they changed, what that field was, and what it was after when they made that change. We'll see that shortly. So it's what we call updatable dashboard technology. And where that gets really quite powerful is if I look at an open PO update, for example, I could be looking at various purchase orders for some of my suppliers here. And if I look at ABC Metals, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy that whole grid out to Excel. They're perhaps not using our supplier portal. We have one if you wanted to utilize that. And I'm going to ask for just some updates on some of these purchase orders. That's actually going to be delivered in tomorrow in 624. But unfortunately, um, this particular purchase order here is maybe now going to be late. So that's now coming in. Well, later it's going to be coming in in 629 instead. So what you can do is you can allow them to actually update this particular um, spreadsheet. And when they're ready, what they can do is send that or email that back to you. And if I copy that grid of data, I can now do what's called a paste update. And what that will do is that will update all of the dates on those purchase orders rather than me monotonously going into every single one of those purchase orders one by one by one. I've just done it on an updatable grid-like view, just like Excel. Now, it's not doing that willy-nilly. It really is validating all the information in the way in. 
later on you'll see a journal entry where I can actually create a journal right from using Excel if I wanted to in the financials. So it is validating the information and the way in. Hopefully that looks good to people. And it changes the way you interact with the system again as a user. If you've got someone at Array Marketing that just updates dates on a sales order and pops comments in, why give them access to order entry? Just give them a nice dashboard view where they can see all of their customer orders and open up the fields that they want to make the updates on. It becomes a lot more usable. They can always drill down from there as well. So that's just a, a quick example of a tactical dashboard where I'm looking at real time information either inside the system on a discovery view like this, or you'll be seeing throughout the demo today various different dashboards that I can get access to as well. Our dashboards go across multiple companies. So if I was looking at inventory, I'm not just looking at inventory in one particular company. I might want to look at inventory across multiple companies. I might be looking at a CRM dashboard here where I'm looking at my pipeline by product. I'm looking at my backlog of orders. I've got a funnel view of that particular order and so on. I've got my quote list in here. So you've got various different ways of analyzing things. I've got a win and loss here. How many quotes have I won? How many have I lost? Because that's a grid, I can group it. I can summarize this grid and I can start to filter this grid, for example. So if I look at the expected revenue and I sum that, and what I then do is I go by won or lost, I can see the revenue that I've lost versus the revenue that I've won just by doing a quick pivot table in there. I could actually say, well, you know what? I wanted to see the reasons why, so I'll do a subgrouping. So here's why I'm winning. Best delivery, repeat customer. Those are the quotes and those are why I'm actually winning those. And I can actually then decide to drill down into that quote if I wanted to from there. So all of these grids can actually be uh, just like Excel. It's Excel-like functionality built right into the grid. Even filtering data as well. I might want to filter that and I may only want to look at part numbers that perhaps start with, let's say, DCD in here. Now I'm only seeing my DCD part numbers and I fil put that filter on there. So again, it's like Excel where I can choose to filter down to certain data. And you'll see some gauges in here for pipeline and such like as well. So dashboards, there's a dashboard creation tool built right into Epicor within executive analysis. Um, we will teach you how to create queries, create dashboards, and edit them. But more importantly, as part of the implementation, we always look for gatekeepers where before someone ever deploys a new dashboard in the menu, we have a gatekeeper in the way. Because sometimes it could just literally mean adding a column of information onto an existing dashboard, and you've got a whole different way of slicing and dicing that particular data to get to it uh, within the dashboard. So let's just go through an example of some workflow and we'll go and pop an order into the system and talk a little bit about business process management rules, your ability to tailor the system without ever touching source code. So if I go and put a new order on the system, so I'll use a hot key in there to go and add a new order, control shift A for me is to add a new order. I'll put a PO in there of uh, AM for array marketing dash 001 dash 90. Um, the customer in this case, I'm going to say it is for Addison. And they're going to need this particular product, let's say by the 30th. I could ship the same day or ship a different day if I wanted to. And then what I'll do is I'll save that particular order. You can use hotkeys. You can click the save button up here. And uh, once I've got the order detail on, I can use the tree to navigate or I can just hide the detail there. I can then pop a new line onto this particular order. Now, because this is a grid, I could be doing it from Excel if I wanted to. So let's go and sell a DCD-200-ML in here. And what we'll do is we'll pull through the pricing for that particular product. There we go. And I can choose the order quantity in here. We'll go and say we'll sell two of those particular items. So what that's going to do is that's now going to present the order to the system at that point. If I just go back to the order detail, it will summarize the totals for me. And here it's about $654. This is a make direct uh, particular order. Remember, we are able to do make to stock, make to order, engineer to order, 
Uh, there's even a configurator built in here to do configure to order as well, as well as lean manufacturing. So we've got that order on the system. Now normally everything would just go from there where that will go through quite smoothly into manufacture or might be a buy direct where I buy it and ship it direct to the customer. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to upset the apple cart here and I'm going to offer some discount. Now, by doing this, I'm going to demonstrate what we just term event condition action. I've set a rule up where if I offer more than 25% discount in here, what actually happens is that field turns red and I get that nasty message as my first action in here asking me if I'm out of my mind. Why am I giving discount on that particular order? Now, if I continue on this path and save that, it's now saying, well, you've got to put in a large discount request. So it's generating workflow where no workflow existed. So I'm going to say it's uh, the end of Q3. And this customer, Addison, you know, they, they really drive a hard deal. That's why I need to get this uh, discount request in here. So you can have drop down as a reason. You can actually have checkbox fields in here, date fields. It could be a palette of information you have to fill out while you submit that for approval request. Now, what happens is that order will now be placed on hold. The discounts will be applied. So you can see the hold has been put on that order. I can't go anywhere with it until it comes off hold. Now, how do you get your workflow today? Everyone typically grew up with email and um, very informal, one way of getting workflow. So yes, I can't send an email out just to say, you know, Penny Lane's just been notified that that order 5632 is 25% above. Um, so it's 26% actually. And all because Addison drive a hard deal. She could click in that link, go and open that order, and of course take it off hold. It's a little bit unstructured because if Penny's not doing her job, I don't particularly want to look at Penny's email um, as we go through this process to see if she's doing her job or not. So what we'll do is we'll just quickly log out Brian Howard here and we'll introduce you to what we call Epicor Collaborate. Now, Epicor Collaborate is a communication tool that's built right into the system, either at a single company level or a multi-company level. And you'll see she's actually got a little yellow notification bell here saying there is a new notification on the system for her. And she should get a notification in there that that order has actually just gone on hold. In fact, it may have actually been routed straight through to Brian Howard. I apologize. So let me just log Brian, Brian Howard back into the system here. I've been playing around with the notifications. So we'll log in Brian. But really what we want is we want more of a structured view of how this works. So Brian will log in. And he will go to his collaboration stream. And the Collaborate tool is really designed to be structured and unstructured collaboration. So there is the order 5632. It's on hold. Now what he can do is he can actually go straight to sales order entry if he wants and take that off hold. Or if he's too busy, he might decide to go and pick in someone else and say, who can I pick on? Well, I might want to send that back to Penny Lane and whoever I want to be able to send it to and actually say, you know, can you look at this instead? And this whole conversation string is not something that's then lost. It's actually part and parcel of the system because when I go back to that order, you're going to see all of this rich collaboration and conversation around that order built right into the order. So I never lose that. You can collaborate around a purchase order. You might be collaborating around events and a customer. So when a customer goes in credit hold, I will get the, the notification of it. But all of this collaboration has actually got context where I can drill down into projects if I'm getting notified about a project, if there's something happening with a customer. I've been asked about Addison. It's just an unstructured question from Scott here. I can now go to customer entry, customer tracker, and go and look at what's happening with that customer, for example. So it's a very rich way of collaborating in the system. Another thing is to be omnipresent. So if Brian Hurd wasn't in the building, and he was perhaps at Tim Hortons down the road getting a coffee and a donut, he might want to get on their Wi-Fi, log in on an iPad here, and he's actually got dashboards deployed using what we call Epicor Mobile Access, where he can go in here and do some large discount approval. There is that dashboard showing me order 5632, 
if I was only looking for Addison's orders, I would just type Addison up at the top here and I can start to slim down all of the results. And it's an updatable dashboard, so he'll take that off hold and actually save that change at that point uh, when he's in here. Now we're going to go back to check the order in a second, but whilst he's also in here, I might just be looking at Billings Bookings backlog analysis where I could actually look at a backlog chart in here. So if you've got execs that are out there that just want to check what's going on in the system without really being in the system, mobile access is a great tool as well for workflow and just for checking information in the system. So let's go back to the sales order now. And that particular order, if we choose to refresh it, you'll see it should have come off hold at that point. And who did all of that? Well, I mentioned earlier the ability to have a change log inside of Epicor. So if I go and look at the change log, it's got a red dot on it. And if I look at the changes at the order header that happened on the 23rd of June, I can actually see blow by blow all of the changes. And there is the order coming off hold of Brian Howard. Uh, half past two in the afternoon, uh, he actually took that order off hold. So every field and every table in Epicor has got the ability to write changes into the, disc, into the change log. So there's no more finger pointing of who does what. You can choose and see who made the updates on that particular table. Any questions? Just going to do a quick check here. Are we going into the right level of detail? Just make sure we've actually still got people engaged on the line. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with, with, with what we're doing. This is... Yeah, thanks. That, that, that was really well detailed. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So that was just a little bit what we call business process management and the ability to actually look at, you know, workflow and create workflow where no workflow actually exists in the system. Now let's just talk a little bit about document association or attaching documents throughout the system. Now there's various ways we can showcase this, but we'll first by start by going into the part master or the item master and just looking at some various items in here. If I take a, a DCD 100 SP in here, I can have attachments that can be shared publicly in a public link out to customers or suppliers. It might be a, a material safety data sheet in here that I've got attached to that particular part. I might be down at the revision level where I've got documents that when I manufacture this out in the floor to revision B, there'll be a setup video that will actually be sent out with that particular job. So that will be available in the shop floor. I could have an inspection form that gets filled out if they're not using our embedded quality assurance module. So you've got documents that can be attached throughout the entire system. This is just at the part level at the moment. And ease of use is key here. If I want to attach a new document, let's say, um, in the system, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a CERT document and I'm going to attach the CERT right to that part. So I'll just drag that and I'll drop it on as a part document. Now what it's doing in the way in here is it's actually going to index this document for me. So I'm just saying this is a cert, put a longer description in there. And part of our enterprise content management is I can give it a status and say that's published, but it automatically inherits the part number, the product code, the type of part is it, a purchase manufactured sales kit. So if I'm ever looking for this document, I don't have to remember the name, that's meaningless tribal knowledge. You can just look at it by looking at any of this particular indexed information. So if you're attaching a document to a customer, you're probably going to put the customer ID in there, the customer name and the date, so I can search for those documents by customer as well. So I click OK, and that document is now attached. And I really do mean attached because we're not physically storing the document in the same ERP database. It could be in SharePoint. It could be in a public file folder. In this case, it's actually in our enterprise content management system which is an encrypted database and the securities against these documents, who can view them, who can check them out to edit them and, and so on. We can set securities up for all of that. So if I actually just view that cert at the moment, you'll see the date, the certification date and the chemical analysis. Now let's go and actually add another document in here, the same cert. I'm going to drag it again, drop it on as a part document. I'll call that a cert. I'm trying to fool the system here. And 
we'll say that's a cert, the status again is published. Now when I click OK, it's saying, hang on, this already exists in the document repository. Do you want to do a new name or do you want to create a version of this? So I'll go ahead and create a new version. And why we do that is it means whoever is using Epicore will always view the most recent attachment. So there is a new certification of test. There are the new parameters I've been put in. So they're always seeing the latest document. Now, if I open up the document repository in Epicore, rather than just viewing it in its native viewer, if I view it in Enterprise Content Management, now we still keep a Docstar branding, this is our product, um, but we are now relabeling it as ECM. I'll see that document, but I'm seeing version two. There is version one of that particular document. Now you can choose to promote and demote these documents if you want to, whenever they're versioned. So you'll always keep a running history. And there is all of the metadata or the index that I was looking at for that particular document. So if I search, for example, by part number, what you'll see in here is you'll see all of the documents associated with that part. If I search by customer, you'll see all of the particular documents that are attached to that particular customer. AR invoices I've sent them and captured and sales order acknowledgements and so on. Now, not only do we store the documents, we can then use these documents in the act of transaction. And again, take tribal knowledge out of the transaction. So I might be cutting a new purchase order. Now, purchase order entry looks exactly the same as order entry in the sales side. That's not by chance. Um, we want things to look the same. We want things to behave the same in Epicor. People wear many hats these days. So I'll do a control S that will create purchase order 4527. I'll now add a line onto that particular purchase order. And we'll go and buy the part that we just put the attachments on the DCD 100 SP. And I'll go and buy a quantity of, let's say, one of those. Now, this is not something I've got a price list set up for in the system. It's actually a manufactured part, but there's nothing from, to stop me from buying something that I make and vice versa if I want to. So we're going to buy that for $122. And what we'll then do is we'll save that purchase order. And what I'm going to do is I'm now going to approve the purchase order. So at the purchase order header detail, we'll just say it's approved. And I can confirm that to the supplier at that point if I wanted to confirm it. Now, there is a supplier portal where they can electronically get that. If I now go ahead and actually print this purchase order, just like the invoice that we saw at the start of today's demo, I can actually route this out to the contact on that purchase order. So Alan McInnes is the, the contact over at ABC Metals. So let's use the purchase order with supplemental documents. And what we'll do is we'll generate this and it will route that right out of the system now. What it's going to do is it's going to send a purchase order. It's going to go to the company document repository, get the latest terms and conditions, attach those to the email. And it's also going to look at the part and say, are there any documents at the part level that also need to go out to the supplier? Now, normally that's all tribal knowledge where people need to remember to do that and manually attach all of that to the email. If I now just pass over back into Outlook and do a quick send and receive in here, what you'll actually see is you'll see it will actually now send those documents right out to Alan McInnes, the supplier, and everything will be attached automatically for me. So there is the email, purchase order 4527. There is the purchase order form. Now, I didn't pop your company logo in this one as I did with the, the invoice, but I could easily have done that. I've got an AutoCAD drawing attached from the part. There's the CERT document that we attach and it should be the most recent one. Yep, there's the yellow highlighting in there, and there's the terms and conditions on there as well. So that's another capability of our document management inside of Epicor, where we can create what we term package files to send out multiple documents. No tribal knowledge needed. Does that look okay, everybody? Yeah, that's great. Post them in my email. Thank you. Whilst I'm in my email, what I'm also going to do is I'm just going to email the system. And what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to say customer Addison. So I'm going to ask the system a question. And what this will do is this actually has got the ability just to showcase some of Epicor's technology where 
if you've got customers that don't necessarily want to use a portal, we have our own Epicor Commerce Connect capability for business to business, business to customer, anonymous shopping and dealer uh, portals. What they can do is they can actually email Epicor. Now they might have to put in a unique code to be able to get a response for more security, but that should email me back everything that's happening with that particular customer, Addison, their orders, their location, addresses, and so on, just so as I can get an update on everything that is going on with that particular customer, Addison, at that point. So it's like ask Epicor a question. Um, we saw Epicor virtual agent earlier. This is just another way of being able to talk to the system. Now that email just may take a, a second to pop back but it will come back with a, a question at that point. So there we go, Addison, quick summary. I've got a link to check where they are on the map. Key contacts, last five orders, last five invoices. So that's just another way of being able to talk to Epicor. You'll see a tool called Epicor Information Worker as well, where we can actually embed Epicor information into any of the office products. We are 100% Microsoft technology stack. So in Outlook here, I can actually look at my customers that I deal with. I could look at their part numbers. I could look at their lead opportunity quotes and so on in here. And from here, I can actually launch right into a new sales order, return material authorization, right from within Outlook. I've even synchronized my contacts from the ERP database. So if I update Andrew Addison's contacts in Outlook, they will be synced back to the ERP system and vice versa. So there's a lot of integration to all of the Microsoft products or the Office Suite using what we call Epicor Information Worker. That's sometimes good for salespeople because they don't necessarily want to live in Epicor. They can actually do their day-to-day -day customer relationship management tasks right from within Microsoft Outlook at that point. So that's just some showcasing some of the flows around document management and so on. I'm going to pop into job entry. And I just want to talk about a little bit about manufacturing capabilities in here. So let's take a look at job 2135 as an example. This particular job is a, a make to order job to make a satellite assembly. Um, I can see my scheduled start due dates in here based on the scheduling engine. I could run capable to promise when I enter an order to get an update of when that's going to be available. Is it make to order? Yep, there's the make to order demand in there uh, as opposed to make to stock. And then I can actually start to see all of the details in that job. So the operations to assemble, bench work, programming, packing. I've got all of my raw materials in here. Red means those are material constraints. They're probably late and need to be expedited. The green materials have already been issued out of the system. I've got some back flush items in here as well. So that's in not to forget, we are a manufacturing system, quote unquote, 40 years of experience out in the marketplace doing make to order, engineer to order, make to stock. There is a, an MRP capability built right into Epicor. So material requirement planning is part and parcel of the system. This is one of these set it and forget it screens where you could run an MRP regen every night, midnight, um, and it will come back with new job suggestions, new purchase suggestions. Or at any time during the day, I could just come in here and do a quick net change. Um, and I might want to filter that down and run it by a specific part or a specific commodity or product line if I wanted to do that as well. So make to stock, make to order is all part and parcel of the Epicor capability. Any questions so far? We've been looking pretty much at day to day tactical information that's inside of Epicor. We also have a tool for BI, business intelligence, and it's what we call data analytics. Now the data analytics tool is more of a self-serve where out of the box, I think with the five licenses you get, you've got a couple of author users in here so people can actually write their own views. And then you might have execs coming in here based on their securities, they'll get access to various views of data. But this tends to be a consumer of strategic data, where I might be taking data that was on your legacy system before you go to Epicor and merging that with the Epicor data in a SQL database if I want to. And then what I can do is I can start to look at more long-term strategic information based on trends. So I'm looking at year-over-year -year sales performance. I've got stack charts in here. 
Um, I've even got geospatial charts in here. I didn't even know what that word meant until we started using EpiCore data analytics, where I could be looking at things like shipping concentrations um, of where I'm shipping to. That's a heat map. I can actually edit that and change it to actual flag markers if I want to see where things are actually going as well. Now, you get these pretty views, but with these views, you can do things like if I'm looking at Dalton, for example, I can focus all of those stats into Dalton. So now what it's going to do is it's going to look at Dalton's gross profit margin only, their year-over-year -year sales performance, and so on. If I was looking at a scrap reporting view, I could be looking at it by employee and just focusing down on that particular employee if I want. Now, the idea with all of this information, I'll just reset it, is it's in the cloud already to slice and dice, so it behaves very quickly, but you're replicating data up there. Because it's strategic, you don't want it changing like it is in a dashboard inside of Epicor. Every time someone puts a new order on, that's potentially skewing or changing this. You might be replicating information monthly, weekly. You can do it hourly if you wanted to as well, so you get the strategic view. Now, the real power of this, for example, is if I'm looking at a year-over-year -year sales performance, I can now start to analyze this data out of the system. Now I get to the underlying data, and I'm looking at my rolling 12 months of performance for parts. And I'm not really interested in parts. I'm more interested in product line or product group. I might be looking at it by customer. So I'm able to slice and dice this data if I wanted to as well. I'm not interested so much in the extended price but I would also like to know what the cost of goods sold was in there as well. Now, I could break that down into labor, material, burden, subcontract, but I'll just look at a total cost, and I might want to look at the gross margin in there as well. So now what I'm doing is I'm actually getting the COGS, the gross margin, right on this particular view. Do I want that by part? I can get that by part if I want to see that information as well. So it's a really powerful way of being able to slice and dice information. I should be selling that DCD 200 at all times along with that DCD 300. There are component or companion parts. If I matrix that data, I can quickly see if I look at it by customer, lost opportunity. Dalton are buying the 300, but they're not buying the 200, and Clark or vice versa. So I've got to get my salespeople to look at that and say, hey, we need to be selling both these products at the same time look into that so as we can get to that data. So it's very powerful too to be able to focus in on data. We also move some of the financial reporting tools right in here as well, where if I want people to self-serve for financial statements, so the headache of trying to get people looking or emailing out financial reports goes away, I can come in here and right now, I'm just looking at a P&L. I might want to look at that profit and loss by company. I might be multi-company. So I've got levels in here where I can now drill down into the revenue at the company level, Epic 01, Epic 03, these are separate companies. So I can see the revenue. If I was doing it by site, I could then also say by plant or site in here, I can now look at the revenue for that company and I can see the revenue in those different sites or locations as well. So there's different levels that you can place in here. I might want to look at it by account or account category, depending how I want to slice and dice this. That's a profit and loss um, based on actual. Um, you can do different reports in here, I've got, uh, FY to D, I've got rolling 12 months in here if I wanted to look at it that way as well. You may want to actually just go and run a trial balance in here, for example, where you're looking at various different types of reports in here. Um, you can actually choose the type of report you're looking at. There's uh, a budget, sorry, a balance sheet as well, if I just want to look at a quick balance sheet report. Now, all of these grids in here too, I can actually export these out into different formats, PDF format, uh, Excel format, if I want to do some slicing and dicing in Excel as well. So that's our business intelligence, or what we call data analytics. Uh, that's a view of more strategic data to allow me to make tactical decisions uh, or strategic decisions, I should say, about the organization. Now, everything I'm showing you today comes part and parcel with what we call best practice. So partners alike, as well as direct implementations from Epicor, 
use EpiCore best practice. And Dan had popped this wheel up earlier showing you all of the capabilities under the umbrella of the EpiCore enterprise resource planning system. But if I'm someone that works in sales, in the sales management suite as we would do a process review or everyone do your process review for you, we come into order man management, we're asking key questions about the challenges you're finding today, some of the values and volumes that you're doing in order entry. But now I want to go in and see, how do I do a customer order? There is a best practice flow already established. We're not coming to you with a blank slate. We're coming to you with best practice views. This is like the 30,000 foot level of how do I create a sales order? Is it coming from a quote to update the order? Is it a new order? So there's various decision lines in here and so on. But when you're ready, what you'll do is you'll create what we call the end user procedure. And we can utilize a tool which is called EpiCore Knowledge Mentor to do that. Now I spent 11 years out in the field implementing EpiCore in Europe and then throughout North America. And every time we got to a point where we had to do the end user procedures by screenshotting into Word or using Visio, everyone groaned and left the room. But with EpiCore Knowledge Mentor, what you're looking at here is a show me, I'm not touching the keyboard. You're able to record a playback of someone entering a transaction on the system. So I can do the show me first. When I feel confident, I can interact with it with a try me. And then you can do the test me and you get a result to say, did I pass the ability for me to enter an order or put an inspection into the system? And that training course can be scheduled using our quality assurance module. So like an airline pilot, once a year, I might have to take that course again, just to make sure I'm up to speed and I'm qualified to use that in the system. The nice thing about doing this using EpiCore Knowledge Mentor, because of our technology in EpiCore, you may wish to personalize some of the forms just by moving columns around and so on. Um, and you can also do that using our application studio, which is built right into the product as well. So this is more for power users, but as a, being a power user, you might want to manipulate just some of the views that you're seeing in here, for example. So they'll get access to what we call the application studio where they can configure the whole system. So I can use the base form. And once I've got that base form set up, I've got my sales order grid that I come into. I might have the order header detail. I want to edit that particular detail view. Um, I've got various different fields in here of things that are going on. Well, you know what? I might want to add a new checkbox into the system where that checkbox is actually going to be um, a user-defined checkbox for me, where in the user-defined settings or the properties of that checkbox, I might want to give it a label where I'm going to flag this as a rush order. So the rush order goes in. I can bind that to the order header table. And once it's in the order header table, I can decide what field that I want to link this to. So it's going to be to a user defined checkbox field if I wanted to do that. So there's various user defined fields in there that you can link it to. You can create your own. And then when I'm ready, this is like WYSIWYG. Uh, if anyone remembers that term, what you see is what you get. You can actually start to play this back and say, well, what does that look like now when someone goes into order entry? And as you record these transactions, you'll see them in preview mode here. It just means that when you do your end user procedures, you're actually recording what your screens look like. So there is that rush order checkbox that I just put on there. I could have a dashboard report now of all orders that are rush orders that I want to bring to people's attentions and so on. So that's just some of our technology. We're not touching source code there. We are literally just doing a configuration on the system and we'd only make the application studio tool you're seeing here available to one or two users within the system to be able to do those configuration changes. Other users will happily, if you want to, let them do things like personalizations where they can change column layouts and so on in the system. Um, they may just want different formatting when they look at a column as I look at my sales orders and I look at the columns within those sales orders. I might not be interested in, in certain things like the revision and so on. So I'll come in here and just personalize those columns and I can choose what I want to see in there. I'm going to switch the revision off, but I do want the customer's peel line that's more relevant to me um, on that particular grid. So now I've promoted the peel line up here and I've got rid of the revision. That's what we call the personalization. 
it's, it's a, an easy to do for a lot of the users day to day to tailor the system. So that's a, a brief overview of the EpiCore system. I wanted to leave some time at the end if there were specific questions.